the time we got to you in Dublin, you got what was left of me and Vanessa. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, well, you and Vanessa had already met on a previous mm. trip when she was there. Um, once she got back on the right train <laughs> and got back to you. Bless her. And the story, it's in her book. <laughs> it is. It is in her book. Um, bless her. She'll never live that one down. Oh, I know. No. <laughs> but... Um, when uh when we got to you it was the first time that you and i got to meet and yeah. it was the first time that david got to meet both of us your husband yeah. um bless him i i think he probably bit off more than he could chew that day I he know. was a good sport <laughs> he, was. He, was, he really was a good sport uh but yeah so but we met you in dublin and we <laughs> had already been in ireland for eight days we had already walked a little over 800 miles total. Mm -hmm. uh, we were mentally, physically, emotionally whooped by this yeah. point. But we weren't leaving Ireland until we saw you guys. Exciting. It just wasn't going to happen. So you guys <laughs> flew in. <laughs> you guys flew in from Scotland. And we all met up in Dublin our last night that we were going to be there. Um, we had so, a sort of holiday beforehand. So we, we got a couple of days in Dublin ourselves as well, which was really nice. Oh, yeah. It's always good to get away. Um, yeah. But the, the plan was just to hang out for the day, maybe do like a lunch, brunch, um, go take in a few sites. And uh, after we were walking around, um, you guys had already been to a couple of places that Vanessa and I wanted to go to. Uh, one in particular uh, is a location that I feel everybody if you ever go to Dublin, this is a location, I don't care what your belief system is, I feel you really need to go. Absolutely. It is a fascinating place with a fascinating history. And the mere fact that it's still there after all this time and after the things that have happened um, to the structure I, is, is unbelievable. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you take it from here and kind of introduce what this place is to the people watching and give a little bit of history to it. Yeah, um, I'm I'm a bit of an amateur historian. If there's anything that I can find out about stuff in the past, I am right there. And um... but you do such a good job at it. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, I, I, I've got a very, very foggy brain because of my own little um, inconvenience, shall we say. <laughs> so um, I I tend to write stuff down so that I've got it so that I can go and look at it because nine times out of ten, about a week after I've looked at it, I've forgotten about it. I know that I've looked at stuff, but I can't remember what I looked at. So please bear with me because I have got some notes here. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Right. So what we're trying, what we are talking about is we're talking about Christchurch Cathedral in Dublin, which is just, it's its a beautiful, beautiful building. And um, what I was able to find out was it was originally a Viking church. So it is as far back as the Vikings. Um, they reckon it was founded in around 1028. And the earliest manuscript to date is actually dated 1030. And it's also the older of the two medieval churches in Dublin, the other one being St Patrick's, which I didn't get to, only got to Christ Church. Um, so when it was originally built, it was built in wood. And it was founded by, and I hope I've got this right, Siegtrig Silkbeard. Um, and he was the Hibernio, Hibernio, sorry, put my teeth back in. He was <laughs> the, the Hibernio Danish king of Dublin. So there was still a lot of Viking influence there. And, you know, you had the, by the, by the sounds of things, you, you had, it was like a cross between the Vikings and the Irish there. Um, if anyone out there thinks I'm wrong, please correct me. Um, and then, 
what I was able to find was it was wee snippets after that because I, you know, I was saying to you the other day there, there's some places and you can get just tons and tons and tons of information. And then there's other places where you just get like wee snippets and all I could get was wee snippets and it seemed to be the same all the way through. So um, one really, really interesting thing um, was in 1171, King Henry of England attended the Christmas service there. And it is recorded that this was the first time that Henry received Holy Communion following the murder of Thomas Beckett. Ah. Do you know who Thomas Beckett is? I recall seeing the name. I want to yeah. say probably on some of the transcripts or some, some of the things that they yeah. had around there. Thomas Beckett was the was a very close friend of King Henry the Second. And in in a nutshell, basically um the Church of Canterbury, the Bishop of Canterbury. Oh so is this like the the, the uh the yeah. Canterbury tales? No kind it, of but Okay. Is so, it like within that time frame? It, it's no, it's it's no. The Canterbury Tales is a wee bit later on, if I okay. remember rightly. This is still this is like eleven seventy one. So this is just over a hundred years since the Battle of Hastings to try and give you a timeline. Oh wow! Battle of Hastings ten sixty six. This okay. Well, this date him going to Christchurch is eleven seventy one. My English history at this time's a bit not too good. If it was Tudors, I'd be able to watch lyrical. This time, no, it's too much. So I'm just going to sum it up in a rough nutshell. So basically, King Henry II, his best bud was Thomas Beckett. Okay. The Archbishop of Canterbury, if I remember this rightly, and once more, please, please correct me if I am wrong, people. The Archbishop of Canterbury, the position came clear, and Henry II gave Thomas Beckett the, the position thinking, well, it's the most powerful position in the church in the land. It means I can control everything. Unfortunately, Thomas Beckett decided to go all God on him and took his new position very, very, very seriously. And they fell out to the point where Thomas Beckett ended up over in France. He, he was basically he'd to run away to France at one point because the friendship was so badly broken because he he was doing right by the church instead of what Henry II wanted, which was for him to do what Henry II wanted him to do. So, you know, he'd, he'd, well, you know what I mean? So, so there's quite a situation there. So anyway, he comes back. There's a sort of reconciliation. And then they... Um, I can't remember exactly what happens, but something happens and it sets Henry off. And all he says is, if I remember it rightly, is, will somebody not rid me of this troublesome priest? And there's four of his knights within hearing distance. And they go down to Canterbury and they go into um, Canterbury Cathedral and um, they, they murder Thomas Beckett in front of the altar. They slice his skull off the top of his head, they scalp him. Now, there is more to it than that. And, you know, it, it's a fascinating story. But um, basically, obviously, when Henry hears, he's absolutely shocked and disgusted because that wasn't really what he meant. And um, he then does a huge penance where he puts a hair, a horse hair, hair cloth uh, shirt on, which is very, very itchy and very horrible. It's what they used to do when they were really, really trying to atone for a sin. And he walked barefoot through, through the streets of Canterbury. And um, he then allowed the clergy at the um, cathedral to um, whip him and beat him. Wow. For his son. But as I say, that is very, very, very roughly what happened. So it was quite a big thing. And because of what would have happened, um, he, even though he had done that and he would have atoned for himself or he felt he had atoned for himself, he only really felt that he could start 
start and take yeah that communion at that point by the sounds of things so it is quite you know, it's, it's a major major point in in the english history of the church and crown because it was like two sides who just you know well, yeah that's one in ten and it went <sighs> off the domain it just shows you just because um someone's your best bud doesn't necessarily mean that you should give them i mean the i you know i've heard the <laughs> saying you know business is business but whoa mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it's wow oh, yeah it was crazy and um Yes, so um, I highly recommend that you go and you read about that and probably find out the correct version because I'm sure I made mistakes there. But anyway, <laughs> moving quickly <laughs> on. Um, so the next thing I came about was Strongbow. Yes. Our buddy Strongbow, yes. Who um, in the UK, people, when they hear um, the name Strongbow, think of a cider. Right. Very, that very was the first thing I thought of when I saw <laughs> the tomb was the Strongbow Cider um, commercials that we would see in the States. <laughs> David and I did it as well, to be really honest with you. So anyway, so we're moving on to the Strong, um, Strongbow now, and he was actually called Richard de Clare, and he was the second Earl of Pembroke. And he became associated with the cathedral in around about 1180 when he and some other Norman magnates helped to fund a complete rebuild of the wooden church. So that's when the church moved from wood to stone. Okay. So we are starting to see some of the structure that you see today. Um, he was a medieval Norman peer and it was his arrival that marked the start of the Anglo-Norman involvement in Ireland. And he then went on to become King of Linsterin in 1171. So he became very powerful in Ireland in his own right. Um, and he is buried in the cathedral nave, as we know. But um, when, his, when the nave collapsed in 1562, his tomb was smashed and it is actually a replacement tomb that you see today because it just got crushed. And um, where am I? I've lost my place. And his tomb was actually used as the venue for legal arrangements between the 16th and 18th centuries. So if you had any like legal work or any legal agreement, that you had to get notarised or you wanted to agree with someone, you met at the Tomb of Strongbow and you did it there. Oh, wow. Yes. So, yes, yeah, so um, <sighs> he, he he is the only king that's buried there. Because oh. um, okay. as far as I find, I could be wrong. <laughs> that's interesting. But, yep, he, he is, he's the only sort of king, kingly person that I, I could find. And then the timeline jumps again. It jumps to 1487. And this is when we get to Tudor history. So I can talk a wee bit better about it now. <laughs> we're talking about Lambert Simnel. And he was supposedly crowned in the cathedral. Now, the reason why he was crowned in the cathedral was he was known as a boy pretender because he was supposedly Prince Edward the older prince of the princes in the tower. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> murdered by Richard III. Okay. Okay. Well. So, because at this point, um, they, it's never been proven, you know, there's two factors. There's the one where you've got the Richard the Third. A belief is, is that no, he didn't murder the princes. Otherwise, their mother Elizabeth would Woodville would never have come back out of sanctuary and into his care. But that's mm -hmm. a way off into another story. Or some people believe it was Margaret Beaufort, who was the very pious and very religious mother of Henry the Seventh, who is King Henry the Eighth's father. Okay. Okay. Wow. This is when it starts, your head just goes. Poof. Yeah, I'm sitting here trying oh. to follow it and I'm like. <sighs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. so this, 
this was just after the the ending of the War of the Roses. Okay. So I'm I'm just trying to think as many phrases as I can that you'll know. <laughs> Right, um, right, right. This is just after that, and Henry the Seventh had obviously won the throne from Richard the Third. So we'd moved from the House of York to the House of Lancashire, and wow. to try and cause and to try and bring peace between them, he married Elizabeth Woodville and Henry and Henry the. Six, no, no, not Henry Six. He was a mad one. It would be Edward the Fifth's daughter. I'm getting myself completely lost here. I do apologise, but anyway, so they were married to bring the line in together, so that you had the main descendant of the House of York married to the mm -hmm. House of Lancashire. So anyway, he wasn't particularly popular because he was a bit greedy and he kept finding people ridiculous amounts of money. Mm -hmm. And um, because the princes had never been found and it never actually been proven that they'd been murdered, there was always this wee bit in the back of people's minds that maybe they were still around somewhere. And mm -hmm. this is where um, Lambert Simnel comes into it because um, as I say, he was believed to be the, the rightful heir to the throne, Prince Edward. And okay. um, and he then went on to attempt to try and depose Henry VII and failed. And basically, I believe um, he was forgiven, but he was made to work in the palace kitchens or something. So he basically huh. became a servant. <laughs> um, wow. That, You've also got Perkin Warbrick, who does have links to Ireland, but um, he, he was further on and he claimed to be the younger brother. But that's another story, but it actually ties into the town of Ayr that you're going to be visiting next year because <laughs> Perkin Warbrick married the, now I think it was the daughter of King James V. And they then went down to Ayr and sailed from Ayr to Ireland in order to start his attempt against Henry VII to try and get the throne back. So anyway, that was him. Then um, in 1539, um, during the um, Reformation um, carried out by King Henry VIII, um, he begins to actually work to assure that the Christchurch Cathedral adheres to the new Church of England structure. Um, that's um, something is that um, it's actually classed, uh, it's actually a Protestant church, it's not actually a Catholic church, it's part of the Church of Ireland. And I thought it was a Catholic church myself, but they're... Wow. They're, and obviously that has been since King Henry VIII, and since then it has it has been within Church of England stroke Church of Ireland ever since. Um, so that's that wee bit. And then the next thing I found was um, 1562, and that's when all the fun happened, because the foundation of the nave slipped because they were built in peat. Apparently, you don't build things on peat that are particularly big. Um, horrible things happen. Yes. And brought down the <laughs> wall and the roof, obviously down on top of poor Strombo's grave. And um, and um, partial repairs were done at that point. And unfortunately, by the start of the 19th century, uh, the building was declared unsafe and could no longer be accessed. It just been left to kind of wow. fizzle out. Um, and it wasn't until 1871 that the renovations that you see today started to take place. So it was the Victorians that got stuck into bringing it up. So I suppose that means that there's bits of that church and while they are absolutely gorgeous and in the Gothic style, it'll be the Victorian interpretation of right. what the, the Gothic style should be, which 
as we know, the Victorians were very good at making up their own version of things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Wonderful, a wonderful example of that is Castel Koch in um, just outside Cardiff in Wales, which mm -hmm. was a fairy tale cottage, um, sorry, a fairy tale castle, which was redone up in the Victorian style of what medieval castle should be i'll send you a link to that building because it's it's beautiful i've been there a couple of times as well and um, but i'll be quiet in that right now and move swiftly on. <laughs> <laughs> everything peeling over and the victorians having to rebuild some of it it means that the oldest part of the building um is the north wall and that as far as the road dates back to 12 30 that's the oldest bit of the building i'm nearly there i promise oh, uh, no. 1690 um, is the next um, thing. So the church is still going. It's just not as, as brawl looking as it was in Tudor or medieval times. Um, and James II um, comes to Dublin after the Glorious Revolution. He was the brother of uh, King Charles II, who was reinstated to the throne after the English Civil War. We have Oliver Cromwell. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And Charles II died without leaving an heir, didn't have any issues. Well, he didn't have any legitimate issues, shall we say. Um, he liked the ladies, but he never actually produced a proper official heir. So the, the throne moved to his brother James, and um, James had um, reverted to Catholicism which in England was very, very much frowned upon. Uh -huh. uh, and it is because of James II that it is actually in the constitution at the moment that you cannot be the monarch if you are a Catholic. Oh, wow. And because everyone was very, very angry at him for doing this and becoming a Catholic and then having the audacity to, to take the throne, um, it brought about what's known as the Glorious Revolution, where basically they bumped him off the throne and kicked him out of the country, and he landed up in Ireland. And um, at that point, the building was um, restored into the Roman Catholic faith so that James had somewhere to attend and take his mass while he started his attempt to reclaim the British throne, which, as we know, didn't happen. And that all led down to Bonnie Prince Charlie at Culloden trying to win the throne back. And we all know how that went. Yes. So <laughs> that's about the, the sort of main body of the church, because then you go down into, and you know what I'm going to say next, we go down into the most amazing place ever, the crypt. Yes. Um, and the crypt, they reckon, was constructed between 1172 and 1173. And it is the largest cathedral crypt in Britain or Ireland, um, measuring 63.4 metres long. And it is, it's very long, it's quite narrow, but it yes. is very, very long. Um, and it's um, it's now full of um, their, their exhibitions and the bookshop and there's some beautiful memorials up in the vault. People are obviously buried down there. And um, it is um, there within the library of the church that they hold a 14th century copy of the Magna Carta, um, wow. which um, has been on display. Um, I don't think I got to see it. I think it was just a little bit too busy, which I am a bit annoyed about because it was one of the reasons why we went there was because I wanted to see the Magna Carta, especially after seeing the Book of Kells, which just blew my mind. But um, <laughs> um, the, the other thing um, is that the church, even though it seems a Protestant church, it does have a relic, which is quite unusual because relics tend to be from the Catholic faith. But because the Church of Ireland even though it is classed as Protestant, it's got Catholic leanings. So that would explain why they've still got a um, relic. Yes. <laughs> and um, it's the heart of, and here we go, here's me trying to 
pronounce something Irish again. I do apologise. Uh, Lerkan Ua Tuthail, who is St Lawrence O'Toole. And I know there's a story about the heart being stolen, but I didn't really get into time because I knew by this point in my notes I was really, really waffling. But there is a story about the heart being stolen and obviously it being recovered. And then um, there's just two other wee facts that um, I wanted to give you. And one of them was that the crypt and the main body of the church were used during the filming of the Tudors. Yes. So, um, they, you know, and I've I've been watching the Tudors again quite recently, and I can actually see the bits that they've used it for. So they they've used it for whenever they're doing a, like a Catholic mass. Mm. Um, they use the organ. Yes, um, that the organ gorgeous, organ. huge organ, <laughs> which I do have pictures of, and I'll be sharing in the episode. But it's massive, mm -hmm. and um, I'm not sure if. Um, I've got a feeling that the, the lad was actually probably miming, but I hope that they got someone recorded playing the music on the organ because that it's it's just beautiful. And um, they used up there for all that. I think they used it for some of the palace scenes. I may be wrong. They also used the crypt area, which um, they used for various bar, you know, like public houses and things. And I also think there was one bit I picked up on and it looked as if they were walking along a sort of vaulted corridor. And it looked basically as if it was in the Dublin, in the Christchurch crypt, I may be wrong, but it looked like the, um, what they'd done with the camera was they just followed them round. So they've like, it obviously walked up that side of the arches, along there and down there that way and along. And I think they just kept doing that until they'd filmed the, the scene. Oh, okay, okay. Um, very interesting, but um, and also they've got they've got some of the costumes which are beautifully made. You know, obviously they are made oh, out yes. of materials. I and did, things. yes, I did get pictures of those because they have those displayed down in the catacombs. Yes, which was so, amazing. So you've got Cardinal Wolseley's habit, the the red. And you've got one of Henry's outfits. There's one I recognised as Anne, as Anne Boleyn's, and another one is Jane Seymour. And I think the other one was one that was worn by, um, uh, Catherine of Aragon. And I suddenly forgot the name of the lady who played that part. And she's an amazing Irish actress. She's actually an outland at the moment as Auntie Castor. I, terrible, I can't, I do apologise. But anyway, so the last thing about Christchurch, which I loved watching while you guys were in the church, was the labyrinth. Yes. And th this is a beautifully carved labyrinth that is actually out in the courtyard. And um, we, were, we were talking about this other day there because we couldn't, we couldn't quite remember why um, it was there, but there there were people, there were people walking it. There were people who were just walking across that didn't know it was there, but there were people who were actually walking the labyrinth. And the reason why it's called a labyrinth, if I remember rightly, is because there's only one path through it, whereas mm -hmm. with a major, lots of different options. So I was able to find out that um, it's it's used as a spiritual tool, um, and it's used for centering your activity. And you walk it, you, you should be walking the labyrinth, the labyrinth in a form of meditation and be walking the path of the labyrinth, the spirit finds healing and wholeness. Now, that to me translates as that isn't just about the Christian religion. Anyone of any religion could use that. And yes. it was lovely to see because there were pilgrims around. And you would see some people that obviously had a faith who mm -hmm. were walking it. And some of them did it quite quickly, some of them did it quite slowly, but you could see by the time they got to the middle of the labyrinth, that beautiful knotwork that's in the middle of it, you could see how the, the effect it had, had on them. Yes. And then, of course, you had the kids who just saw it as a fun game and were running Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so while you guys were actually in Christchurch, because you went in separately from us, 
um, David and I were sitting watching people watching and also looking down into the bit of the, the, the exposed part of the crypt. Yes. That is well, which is closed off because it is it's it's just so fragile now. Um, yes, I, I can't remember the date for that, but it makes me think that maybe the crypt area and I could be this is just me thinking, um, I think that the crypt could actually be bigger than they think it is, but Oh, I have a sneaky <laughs> suspicion that the crypt area, because like you were saying, when you're walking towards the cathedral, um, I, I do have photos and all that I'm, I'm going to share within this episode um, of it's an exposed crypt area, like you were saying, and it's a good size area. And, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, you, you know, they have it quarantined all, you know, corded off and all. You can't get down in there, but it's open so you can get pictures and all. It's a good size area. It makes me wonder how many more of those are mm -hmm. all around that entire block or blocks, if you will. Oh, uh, I'm fairly certain that there's many more that haven't been exposed that are laying around there quite quite possibly you know when you look at edinburgh and you've got the because edinburgh is basically a city that's built on top of a city that's built on top of a city mm -hmm. and you know, so there's and you know what they found in york as well and things that they found in dublin with the viking era as well you know there, there must be other things under there but obviously you know you can understand them not wanting to maybe go and dig it all up you know the grounds are beautiful you know I oh, think yes. I was upset <laughs> oh yes what, what I found room. what I found a, a amazing about the cathedrals is not only the the natural beauty of it the the uh, architecture of it of course and the um craftsmanship and and everything that was inside of it um it was just the standing there and being in the mere presence mm -hmm. of knowing how long of the known history of this building has been there and knowing what all it had been through and standing there being a pagan mm -hmm. and feeling nothing but acceptance. Yes. I did not feel unwanted I did not feel threatened I did not feel segregated I didn't feel I felt completely welcomed mm -hmm. and not... it was wonderful it was wonderful and like you said um I'm talking about the labyrinth we saw people of different faiths and it was obvious because of the way they were dressed mm -hmm. um I even saw Muslim I mean mm -hmm. I saw all sorts of people from all around the world mm -hmm. you know and it was a warm feeling amongst everybody because you would pass each other and you would smile and nod. Mm -hmm. And it was such a safe, warm place. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here thinking, it's like you don't want to leave. Mm -hmm. You know, it was it was that great. It really yeah. was. After, after we'd walked around, when we'd, we'd done our visit, we actually sat in the, the nave for quite a wee while, mm -hmm. just walking, you know, people and just just soaking up the atmosphere. Um, and then you know, David David is a complete and utter athe atheist. Mm -hmm. You know, he he puts up with my love of old buildings, <laughs> and my love of history. Um, and um, he, you know, even he sat quite relaxed as well. But um, of all the churches and cathedrals that I've been in my life because I've been in a lot you know family holidays that's what we did we went mm -hmm. around old castles and old cathedrals and hmm I wonder why I get I have a interest in paranormal and um history <laughs> um <laughs> um and it is one of the few churches since I became pagan that I have walked into and thought oh this is lovely there's somewhere yeah. you you can just hear them going, witch, witch, she's a witch. You know, <laughs> you, can, you just have this feeling that it's been picked up on. But um, yes, it's it's a beautiful place. And I would like to go back at a quieter time of year. Oh, I'm yes. 
Yes, it was definitely um, tourism season <laughs> when we were there. It was a lot of people. It was um, coach, the pilgrims everywhere. It was everywhere yeah, you went. It was like it was. Oh, like, I believe there was even um, a couple of schools were there yes. on mm -hmm. a trip that day, um, yep. which was actually really cool to see. To see mm -hmm. that they bring these young people to mm -hmm. learn about the history and everything. I, I, I was I was overwhelmed by seeing that. I think that's great. Right. For the school group that was in Dublin with us, they mm -hmm. were very, very rude and very, very noisy. And um, they nearly knocked me over. So apart from that group, yes. So <laughs> <laughs> I remember you fussing about that particular group. I remember you fussing yeah. about them. Yeah. But the they, they the idea them. of trying to get them exposed yes. to it, you know, I I think is is great. Um and like you were talking about the the labyrinth, because I um I did stumble across some footage that I'm going to share um of the people walking the labyrinth. And it's just you can even watch the few seconds of the video that I have and feel to the, the energy, the positivity. It's just so calming. Okay. <laughs> you know, it was because Vanessa and I were sitting there. We were actually at another location um, a few nights before, mm -hmm. and something had come to her about a maze, a maze, a maze, a maze. And we couldn't figure out what it was. So when we walked out and you pointed it out and you were telling us what it was in the original clip of the video with the original audio, you can hear me say, well, Vanessa, there's your maze. But it's That's not what it was. It's <laughs> but it's but it's a labyrinth. But it uh -huh. made sense to us because mm -hmm. we're like, that's what they were talking about. They knew we were coming here yeah. and they wanted like they wanted us to see this the, there was yeah. a reason they wanted yeah. to make sure we saw this but i think we were hearing maze because they knew that's what we would know it as mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. wouldn't know it as americans we wouldn't know it as a labyrinth yeah. mm -hmm. we would know it as a maze well, and of course, she had another incident where she kept picking up on the moldy bread. Yep, on the moldy bread it, with the kids. Your, your bread was indeed moldy. Yeah. Yep, and <laughs> our whole loaf of bread, which shouldn't have been moldy. We just ate sandwiches the night before. We went to go retrieve it. Completely molded. Yeah, that was, that was interesting. Speaking yep. of interesting, after <laughs> we did that, you and David being wonderful, wonderful people that y'all are, uh, we decided we were going to go and grab something to eat. Mm -hmm. Yes. We first stopped at this one place um, to actually get something to eat. Uh, we went past the, uh, the castle. Yeah, we, we actually went into Dublin Castle. We went into the part that you're allowed to just walk into. So we went we went and we sat in the cafe at Dublin Castle so you could see out over the gardens. Yes, that's what it was. But you, you guys didn't have time to go up yes. and round the, the, the rooms of state, because that's mm -hmm. what it is. It's the rooms of state, which are, which are beautiful. Um, so we sat there. So you, you you got to go to Dublin Castle. You got to see the courtyard. You got to see the tiny, tiny wee bit that is actually a castle because the rest of it's just basically built up now. Um, it's just basically the tower is the only bit of the original castle that's still there. Yeah, they actually um, had. Um, I think they were doing some renovations to it because there was a lot of scaffolding yeah. around it where they were doing a lot of work to it. Mm -hmm. So I think I think um, it was pretty much limited to pretty much anybody of being able really to see anything, yeah. um, unfortunately, because I have some really good pictures of it, but there's scaffolding all around, all around it. So hope I'm hoping to return to Dublin one day and maybe I'll be able to actually go there and 
you know, and actually be able to maybe go in and then and see it. But um, after we did that, we decided to take a little stroll around Dublin and mm-hmm. do some window shopping and and uh, take in the sights. The street performers were amazing. Uh, mm-hmm absolutely amazing um that one guy that was doing all the juggling and stuff i i, I was sure they were going to have to call a medic before it was <laughs> <laughs> before it was over with they didn't um nope. i was like a kid in a candy store when i got to see the dublin fire truck come by because you know retired firefighters yep. so it's, i was like Ew, i was all excited um it doesn't take much for me i don't get out often um <laughs> But we ended up, uh, before we had to go and get on our bus to return to the airport, because uh, we weren't going to fly out till the next day, but we were just going to hang out at the airport for the night. That was fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we decided we're going to go and uh, just have a, have a little drink, have some coffee, something, whatever, uh, spend the last couple hours just relaxing. So... You're in, uh, uh, in in Ireland. You're in Dublin. You can't leave until you actually go to a pub. You have to go to a pub. Yeah. So we do. Yes. A lovely meal. It was lovely. Until. <laughs> Things got real weird. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, we had had our dinner in the sort of dining area of the pub which was this gorgeous balcony that went along the top and um, then it was announced that they had a a local singer on and it's like well you're in Dublin you're in Ireland you're in a bar it's not a night out in Dublin until you've actually heard someone pick up a guitar or something and sing a song so we decided that we would just stay there so we went down into the bar area and took our seats at what was probably the tallest table that I had ever sat at and the tallest stools. Now, I am a good six inches taller than you, and I had trouble getting up into the seat. I needed a running start. <laughs> I was about to say, you, I think we should have asked for a step ladder for you and Vanessa. <laughs> it, was, it was sad. Yeah. It was sad. So we got ourselves sorted. Um, David and I, we'd had um, we'd had our traditional Guinness the day before, but we also like our Murphys. So we we both had a pint of Murphys. You guys were kind of okay at that point and you said that you didn't want anything. And it was like Vanessa just kind of went, oh. and what I thought at first was just it was at first I thought it was just hysteria from just being so tired and so emotional <laughs> and just 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 done in and um, so I offered to get a coffee and um, so I went and got a coffee and sat it down in front of her and she got very very excited at the fact that there was two chocolate digestive biscuits with the coffee and it <sighs> It was, it was almost as if she was drunk, but she hadn't actually drunk any alcohol. And she... Not a drop. Not a drop. And she she started laughing and putting her head down on the table and then looking up. And then she would take one look at me and she just burst out laughing again and down in the table. And like we were like, yeah, that's it. Vanessa's had enough. She needs to go home. You know, it's, it's, it's gone too much for her. And then all of a sudden, she put her hands on the table and looked up right at me. And her pupils were huge. Now, I know that we were in quite a dark area. Mm-hmm. But even for that, her pupils were huge, absolutely huge. And she looked at me and she went, I can hear you. I can't see you. At which point, you and I looked at one another. Yeah. And went, that not Nessa. Uh-uh. <laughs> That's yeah. <a> minute. <laughs> yeah. We knew, we knew something was up because Ooh. when she did that, mm-hmm. and I immediately, I just kind of looked at her and mm-hmm. I looked over at you, and you were already looking over at me. 
And um, I believe that's when I started grabbing her because I was already, already reaching for some of my stuff out of my bag. Yes. And I was grabbing her on her elbow and I was tugging her. And you were like, Vanessa, um, don't you want to go out for a cigarette? And she's like, oh, and she's just going on and on and on. And I'm like, yeah, come on. Come on, Van. We need to go outside for a cigarette. Mm-hmm. And I was because tugging and tugging. Out, I am an ex-smoker, so I am not going to recommend to someone to go outside and have a cigarette. But <laughs> at that point, it was it was necessary, folks, you had to get out of there. Um, because I knew there was a, a significant we knew there was a significant attachment and something was about to go down and I really needed to get her away from as many people as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like I, cause Vanessa and I have shared this experience with other people and I tell people the best way I can describe it is if you've watched the movie Practical Magic and the scene where they're all, um, the where they're all sitting around the table drinking the margaritas and they're they're all like kind of like yelling stuff out and they're like ah oh, you know they're like they don't know where it's coming from and they're like where did this vodka come from and the aunts are like someone left it on the porch or something like that yep. that was the first thing that I thought of when she did that I can hear I was it I can hear you but I can't see you it That scene from the movie was the, I don't know why, but that was the first thing that hit me. And I was like, oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, oh, no. I don't know who you are, but you got to go. (laughs) You are not going back to the States with us. You didn't pay for no ticket. You stay in here. (laughs) So I grab her and she's all, while I'm trying to get her out the pub, of course, it's a pub. It's crowded. Mm-hmm. So we're kind of bumping into people. She's like, hey. And I'm like, Vanessa, come on. <laughs> she's like, really friendly with everybody. And I'm like, more so than normal. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, come on, Vanessa. And everyone's like, you know, kind of looking at her. I'm like, she's just, I'm just trying to air. You know, come on, Vanessa. So I get her outside and we, we had a, you had to go through like, like a little corridor thing and we go outside and I get her back to the wall Mm -hmm. because I want to make sure she couldn't get away from me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Because we've all seen how she will take off when she's communicating and when something takes over her. So last thing I needed was for her to take off running in front of traffic in the middle of Dublin. Mm. Mm-mm. No. No, that would not be good. So I had her back against the wall, and I had a little, one of the little um, dram vials of mm. some oil that I had made, some sage oil. It was one of the few things that I was able to grab quickly. Mm-hmm. And... I had her wrist and I was holding her against the wall and we were like face to face. And I'm pretty sure some folks were looking at us like we were absolutely nuts. And they probably thought she was just drunk and that I was just a friend trying to get her to settle down. And I put her, I hold her wrist down. And the whole time I'm holding her wrist down, I'm taking my one hand. Good thing I was a cop. And knew how to handle handcuffs with one hand. Because I'm taking this dram bottle. And I'm like getting the top off of it. While I'm holding her wrist down. And I'm getting the top on. And I drop the top. And I'm just like soaking her wrist down. As hard as I can. And the whole time I'm doing both of her wrists. Now I'm like switching the bottle back and forth. And I'm like eye to eye with her. And I'm like I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're doing. But you need to go. You need to leave my friend. I I need Vanessa back. And she just looks at me. Doesn't say anything. But just. (laughs) The most maniacal laugh and grin. And I just start ringing 
on the wrist, start grinding that oil in. And then I start taking it and just start rubbing it on the head, on her forehead. And she's like turning her head away from me. I'm like, you need to go. This goes on for a few minutes. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, all the color comes back to her face. Her pupils go back to normal. Mm-hmm. Her eyes kind of roll around and she goes, and she looks and she looks around. And I said, and she looks at me. She goes, how, how do we get out here? And I looked at her. I said, what's the safe word? Because we have a safe word. She gave me the safe word. And I said, my God, woman. And she's like, what happened? So I told her. As I was telling her, there was two young ladies that worked at the pub that we were all in. They were out having a smoke break. Well, they were witnessing this. And they came over and asked if Vanessa was okay. And we were like, yeah, um, I know that was weird. (laughs) And sorry you had to kind of witness that. And Vanessa was like, I'm a psychic medium and I got jumped by something. And then she starts describing a Mm -hmm. man, an individual and starts describing an injury, talking about his head and everything. And she was like, who got killed here that looks like this? And this happened to him. Well, the other one, one of the young ladies had to go back in because her break was over. The other young lady is standing there talking to us. And while Vanessa's explaining all of this, the young lady just gets this look on her face. And she says, um, that wasn't here, but... That happened at a pub right down the block that I used to work at. She said, I know who you're talking about. I know what happened. And I was like, wow. And she said, so what you're just telling me, that was him that was doing all of that. And I was like, yeah, I said, did you see, you know, I was like, did you see the way she was looking at me, the way she was smiling? I was like, that wasn't her. She said, no, that would have been him. She said, cause he was, he was mean. He was mean. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, well, he's going to stay here. Cause he ain't going <laughs> with us. <laughs> it was. By that point you had come out. Yes. we've been out there for a little bit. Yes. And you had come out there. And I think you even made the comment. You were like, okay, she's back. No. <laughs> as soon as you looked at her. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was scary because. Mm-hmm. I never had to take an attachment off with. Out in an uncontrolled environment. With that many bystanders around. Because had it gone out of control, I really don't know what I would have done. Mm-hmm. I would yeah. have been screwed. Mm-hmm. I was but- terrified. I was terrified. But I had to let this thing know, mm-hmm. you know, you got to go. I, I, I was terrified, but I couldn't let it know that. Yep. But at least now you know that if it happens again, you can take control in a busy situation like that. Yeah. I just hope it doesn't happen again. <laughs> yeah, but um, this is I just, Vanessa we're talking about. I, this is true. This is true. <laughs> um, bless her. She had to, um, her and Loper both. I had that one time. Yep. At the barn in Virginia, yeah. here in Virginia, mm-hmm. that they had to get something off of me. Um, that I'm still dealing with the repercussions of that. We all are. All three of us still deal with the repercussions of that. Um, it still rears its ugly head from time to time. Yep. And uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> uh, the perfect storm me Loper and Vanessa Mm -hmm. Um, we have our Scotland trip coming up as everybody knows next year (laughs) and we had a situation 
at, um, I will say it was at Loper's house, and I had to come to his residence and handle a situation here just a few nights ago that's paranormal in nature. Mm -hmm. And I had to do a couple things to take care of it. A couple of nights after that is when Vanessa's book that she ordered for the Scotland trip. I'm not going to give away what the book is. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to give away what I handled at Loper's house. But they do correlate. Mm -hmm. And you'll tell me once we stop filming. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Laura's like, yay! The book that Vanessa ordered two nights after I handled the issue at Loper's house disappeared yeah and it well, has yet to been found yeah at least we've been able to get a, a free ebook yes version of it for her so yes but it's the synchronicities it. yeah and every time the three of us are going to get together to work on something it's just um, this shit always starts happening so that's why we dubbed the three of us the perfect storm <laughs> It's something about this particular entity or entities that don't like the three of us together. Yeah. But too bad, so sad, it's going to happen anyway. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But yes. Um, I will close this out with thank you for everything that you have done um, for this episode, getting all that information and enlightening us. Um, I have a lot of stuff to show everybody in the episode with um, uh, photos, the, the the tile floors that are in the cathedral. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, constructions because um, the original medieval ones were destroyed. Yes. So um, they are reproductions, and it's very rare to see tiles so so bright and, yes. and the colours that they would have been. Because when you look at lights of um, you know other old cathedrals and things, are very faded and very scuffed. So these are these were actually remodelled in the Victorian times. Yes, and the, the it, colour just pops. It, the colour so does pop. I have vi- I have some brief video of it, um, just so that people can see it because not everybody's going to be able to go over there to, to see this. And I, I'm, I really want to share as much as possible about this beautiful cathedral with, with everybody. But um, also Lorna is our boots on the ground for hidden gems, Scotland, 2021. Yes. Take a bow, take a bow. <laughs> she has done a tremendous job. Um, with the research, uh, without spilling spilling too much information, I think everybody's going to enjoy this a lot. Um, guys, I, I can't even begin to tell you how much work she has done and how much information she has found. And some information she is keeping to herself as requested by Vanessa and I in the event that a reading should start happening, which it's me and Vanessa. So, you know, that's going to happen. Um, but yeah, but so I've, we're I've really been, I've been giving you all the, the sort of basic history that everybody knows and yeah. more detailed, but stuff that you said that you knew about, but I've been able to go a wee bit deeper into it. But um, with places that we're visiting, I've, I've kept that back. Mm hmm. Yes. So, but Lorna has done so much work. She has been amazing. She is the head researcher of this project. (laughs) So, and we have a couple of other friends that are going to be tagging along. So Mm -hmm. we're looking forward to all of this and we're so excited. And April of 2021 cannot get here soon enough. And everybody's saying, well, because of we can get all the research done but yeah well everyone everybody's saying well because of corona you might not be able to go and i'm like shut your mouth i'm going <laughs> i don't care if i gotta swim yeah but you, you took the insurance out so that just in case you had to rebook you could rebook so i know but it's just <laughs> I, whatever people God, shut up just whatever 